Hello everyone and welcome to my career mode let's play slash tutorial in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.1 with the Making History DLC. Now if you don't have the DLC that's fine, I'll try and make clear how I would build the rockets without the DLC and sometimes I'll run the mission with those rockets instead of a DLC version, we'll see. But uh, yeah, it'll be possible to follow along either way. In any case, the first thing we need to do is take a look at our Space Center. And right now our Space Center buildings are not upgraded. They are the base level buildings, and that's me mean, that means that they put restrictions on us. For instance, launch pad says that our max vessel weight is 18 tons and vessel size 20 meters. Uh, well, uh, I guess that's length and width. In any case, um, it constrains our size and our mass. And if you want to undo that, we need to upgrade it for 100,000 funds, and then we get a max vessel size of 140 tons. And so we want to aim to do that. But should we do that first, or should we upgrade the tracking station first? That costs a lot more. This is hard mode, and if you don't know how I set up the difficulty, you should watch the video before this, which is video 00. And also, if you want the clouds, that's video 00A. So I explain the settings that I'm using. And so the buildings might cost more than in your game, if you're using easy, normal, or moderate. And uh, here, we get patched conics. Now, it says orbits visible visible in the map. Patch conics means when you're encountering another celestial body, let's say the moon. Uh, well, then your orbit changes uh, in regards to the moon. There's your orbit in regard to your default planet Kerbin. This is Kerbin that we're on right now. And once you reach the moon's sphere of influence, where its gravity is more important than Kerbin's, your orbit is going to uh, if you have patch conics, your orbit will show what it's doing around the moon. Uh, if you don't have patch conics, it'll only show what your orbit is doing around Kerbin, and you won't even see your moon encounter. So you'll try and go to the moon, but you won't really be able to see what's happening around the moon and whether you even get to the moon. We want to be able to see whether we get to the moon or the other planets and stuff like that. Especially with interplanetary missions, there's just, well, there's a way of doing it without patch conics, but it's a pain in the rear end. So uh, we probably want patch conics. And also you'll notice this max DSM power. That's our communication network. By default, it's two Gs. Um, well, that's its range, uh, two gigameters. And here it is 50 gigameters. So that's quite an increase in our range. And we certainly want that before doing interplanetary missions. So that's a consideration. Vehicle assembly building. Max part supported 30. Well, you're going to find out very quickly that that's a pretty serious limitation. You're going to want to have more than 30 parts. In fact, in some ways that's a more serious limitation than the 18 ton thing sometimes. But it costs much more to upgrade this than it does to upgrade the launch pad. Okay, mission control. Uh, upgrade 150,000. Right now we can only pick up two contracts. And that's how we get funds and sometimes science and of course reputation. So. With two active contracts, it makes it difficult to pick and choose which contract we ought to do. If we upgrade this, we get seven contracts. And not only that, if we already have the tracking station upgraded, we will have flight planning, which means we can plot maneuver nodes ahead of time. So not only will it show us what encounters we have with other planets, but we can plan those ahead of time. So that's important. The upgrades to the runway and space plane hangar are analogous to the VAB and the launch pad. So again, 18 tons, but this time for the runway. And the max part supported 30, this time for the SPH. Now, of course, uh, in this version, you can take any craft from the SPH and send it to the VAB. And as long as you have your VAB upgraded, you can launch it. But you would be launching it vertically. So... That's up to you. Um, astronaut complex. Right now we can only have five active Kerbals and they can't get out of the spacecraft. If we upgrade it, they can get out of the spacecraft. We can have 12 of them and they can plant flags on places. And so, well, EVAs give you a lot of extra science. So you, you will want that. Research and development. Uh, we'll, we'll go into the building to see what that means. Administration building. I practically never do anything with this. And basically what this is for, let's pop into it quickly, is if you want to trade off some of your other... So we've got funds here, reputation here, and science here. 
And what the administration building basically allows you to do is um, change one into the other. So if you take a contract and you, uh, part of your reputation gains will give you funds like this. I generally just want to get the funds the regular way with a contract. And so I'll use my reputation to get better contracts and thereby get better funds, right? I, I really don't need this strategy in order to do that. Similarly, if I want to take funds and turn it into science, I'll launch a mission to get science. Uh, that seems to be a much more straightforward way and really uh, more conducive to what I want to be doing in this game instead of managing strategies. So I don't know, I, I've never gotten into that. Some people probably have. Uh, research and development. Well, this is your tech tree and you start off with these parts and they're fairly limiting and so you get science in order to unlock further parts and even if you've unlocked this uh, technology if you're doing it in hard mode you're going to have to pay funds to unlock uh, to research the particular parts so that's the thing and you can see the tech tree is reasonably big if you have mods that it gets bigger and uh, yeah if you take a look at the upgrade for the research and development building it says research science limit 100 what that means is right now we can unlock these which cost 90 science you can see it shows the cost on that little blurb there but we cannot unlock these it says so cannot research technologies over 100 science so we will have to upgrade the building before we can unlock those but obviously that's going to be a while and so that that'll be a later one we're mostly interested in these top four here if you will okay so that's basically the buildings and now we can go into the vehicle assembly building oh actually before we go to the vehicle assembly building it might be good to get some contracts so gather scientific data from Kerbin all it says is recover or transmit any scientific experiment data from Kerbin to achieve this goal I think we can do that and we can launch our first vessel we won't get escape the atmosphere or, or orbit Kerbin first. Okay, that doesn't give us much of an advance, frankly, but hopefully we can build our first vessel quickly. So we have two modules, and it might be interesting to test which one, I mean, even though we're a little bit strapped for cash, I'm interested to see which one is more aerodynamic. It looks like it should be the Mark I pod, but this onion is lighter, it also has a decoupler, but that doesn't help with the aerodynamics. Uh, it has built-in ablator. Ablator is what you need to survive high heat re-entries. And so the ablator is basically stuff that peels off and takes away the heat. Uh, basically, it burns instead of you. So the Mark 1 command pod does not have any ablator. Okay, so you'll need to have a separate heat shield for it, and we haven't unlocked that yet but it has a reaction wheel. A reaction wheel is a piece of little magic device. Uh, real reaction wheels are really weak. Uh, the reaction wheels in Kerbal Space Program are very strong and reaction wheels uh, allow you to turn without the use of your rockets which uh, ba basically they're little spinny things and because of conservation of angular momentum you spin the opposite direction than the little spinny things that you're uh, using electric charge to spin inside your craft. Um, if you think about this, you should figure out that these can't be that strong, and indeed that is the case. Uh, but they are very effective in the stock game in Kerbal Space Program, and so this reaction wheel can help orient your spacecraft very easily. In fact, even on launch, it can help control the craft, whereas this one does not have that, and so it's a little bit harder to control. But it does have a decoupler, which I like. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll start off with this one. This is a DLC one, and uh, once again, I'll, I'm going to do the exact same thing with the Mark 1 pod, and we'll see which one's better, basically. This is our only engine right now. This, uh, this is the engine category, and this is our only engine solid fuel booster. I'll talk about exactly how to build rockets uh, in the near future, but for now, we don't have any choices, so and we don't have any fuel tanks, so it would be pointless for me to discuss that. We have this girder segment. Now uh, some of you might have watched uh, videos where people do this sort of thing and hot stage the SRBs. You can do that. Uh, what you do is you 
before this one runs out, light that one, and before and then that one will cause this one to explode. And as long as you time it right, you can do it. But I made this channel and called it the Elegant Design Bureau. And the reason I made the channel in the first place is people were doing ridiculous things like this, and uh, so I don't allow that. So one thing we need now, we, I, I don't feel like I need fins. Maybe I need fins. But it's an, it's an additional cost here. We've got 25. Fins help make sure that these are not controllable. They're just stuck on. And so you can't use them to control your craft. But they'll keep you going in the same direction. Just like any dart fins would. So maybe we'll have three. Ah, placing things. So at the start I was just picking it up and placing it. But just now I press the key, I pressed C. So here, if there's a little round circle there, that removes snap. If I press C again, this causes it to snap to a certain angle. See? And that's 15 degrees, I think. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but I think it's 15 degree gaps. So... There we are. And if you want to change this with a key, that's X. And so you have symmetry of 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8. There are mods to give you other kinds of symmetry if you want them. Okay. Final consideration. Is this too much? Oh, final consideration mark 1. Uh, we need a parachute. So in the stock game that's in utility and now we have a parachute and I'll stage it like this check your staging rocket first then decoupling then parachute so now the final consideration our thrust we have I'm going to uh, call the thrust 19 tons so and this is 16 tons what I'm doing is I'm moving the decimal point one space so I'm going to call this 16 tons of thrust roughly and this 19 tons of thrust. It'll show you that this at sea level is what that is, ASL, at sea level and vacuum. Since we're mostly interested in getting off the ground and we're not going to get into vacuum anyway, we're probably looking at that one, 16 tons of thrust it says. And so just again, just move the decimal point over to the left one place and then you've got it. 16 tons of thrust, and how many tons mass do we have? Well, we're only 2.4 tons. So we've, if we've got 16 tons of thrust and we're only 2.4 tons mass, this is going to be very powerful. So I'm going to tune it down to 50%. Now do the math. That's 8 tons of thrust to 2.4 tons of mass. It's still pretty darn powerful. And, and what's the g-force that we expect from this? The g-force that we expect from this, taking out your calculator, 8 divided by 2.4 is 3.33. Uh, initially, that's what we start out at, and then by the end we'll have more. So we're getting off the ground with 3.33 g's of acceleration. In other words, 3.33 times gravitational acceleration. You have to be at least 1, otherwise you're not going to go up. If you get 0.9, in other words, if your thrust is less than your mass, then you're not going up. So if this was 24 kilonewtons, then we would not be going up. Or we would just hover first, and then we'd start going up because we'd lose some fuel. The fuel would diminish, we'd get lighter, and then we'd start going up. But anyway, you get the picture. So let's start with this, and that's still serious g-forces for our Kerbal. And our first Kerbal will be Jeb because he's knocked in already. Uh, they do have these hangers here, uh, if you want to change the outfit. Um, the, the Kerbals look more defined in that version. I'll just keep it traditional. Okay, so we'll, we'll call this, by tradition, Alpha. And we want to take a good look at how high we get with this, because we're going to compare it to the Mark I capsule. Okay, we could have dumped the ablator, but I didn't. Okay, SAS is your stability system. Just turn it on. In this case, uh, there's no reaction wheel and no way for Jeb to actually control the craft. So SAS is probably irrelevant. 
but yeah, um, probably best just to get into the habit of pressing T to enable it so that, you know, our pilot is capable of keeping things stable. All right, here we go. Uh, let's quickly do a crew report. I'm gonna just keep that. We'll, we'll... I know I haven't done the launch pad science, but I always save that for emergencies. Okay, we are out at 3,600 meters. I'm gonna decouple. And it looks like we're getting to 5,083, okay? Now I'm going to activate the parachute. Now the indicator over here will tell you whether it's safe to deploy the parachute or not. If it's in red, don't. Um, generally I wait until my velocity is 270 or less before deploying the parachute. That would be a good idea. So we've lost the cost of that piece, but we'll recover the cost of this piece. You can right click on the parachute in order to change its uh, when it deploys, but I don't suggest fiddling around with that just yet. So yeah, even though it's going to be an additional cost, I'll try to mark one pod. After all, it's good to test things when you're using cheap vessels, and we got quite a fair amount of funds from this particular launch anyway. And so we want to determine as early as possible how good these various capsules are, whether this one is better than the other one, without a fairing, because we don't have fairing pieces. This one might be better if it's enclosed, uh, enclosed in a fairing, because of its shape, but we don't have fairings yet. Okay, we earned a total of 5.1 science, and we got a thousand funds back. So this is the end mission dialogue, and you can see the information. Oh, by the way, we can unlock more technologies, but let me do the Mark 1 pod test first. So Mark 1 pod cannot decouple this bit. We do not have a decoupler. We will get decouplers but we don't have one right now. So it's gonna be carrying this down. And I'm not too sure I want the fins. Maybe. The problem with the fins is, of course, they keep you pointing in the same direction. And once we start going down, that's going to be straight into the ground. But I guess I have to keep things consistent for the test. So we'll leave them on. So it's just pod for pod, no difference. We'll have Valentina go this time. And let's see how high we get. I haven't changed the uh, thrust limiting on this. Same thrust limiting. Uh, alpha 2. Okay, SAS on, throttle up. And throttle doesn't matter for these. Solid fuel boosters do not respond to throttle and you can't shut them down. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but again, it's a good idea to get into the practice of throttling up and turning SAS on at the start of your missions, so I do it anyway. Now on the other one we were carrying extra blader here, we're carrying extra mop propellant, so maybe it all balances out. Here we go. Well, it seems like the burnout happens much later here. Yeah, the aerodynamics of this are much better much better obviously I mean that's not even close to being a comparison right we get to double the height so uh, without fairings you should not be using that that Soyuz like well Vostok like pod now I want to make sure that we activate the parachute before it decides to flip us around and makes us go nose into the ground let me start it off here. Yep, there we go. Now this did have the reaction wheel, so it's probably holding steady a little bit longer than I thought it would. Ooh, G forces. Okay. Well, we'll be will we get the little SRB back? That's an interesting thing. Uh we're pretty close to the launch pad there. 
Oh, if you're wondering how to pan the camera like this, that's holding your middle mouse button down. So uh, scrolling the middle mouse button is zooming. Right click to go this way or like that. And then uh, hold the middle mouse button down to move it like that. That's pretty good for taking interesting screenshots and doing cinematic stuff. A lot of games don't have that feature. Oop, there we go. And we get all the value of this back, so very nice. Except for the fuel cost. You do lose the fuel cost. So 0.5 science earned, uh, 1,213 funds from recovered parts, and we've learned something. We've learned that the onion capsule, we don't use it without a fairing. Basic orbital rocketry, unlock, and engineering, 101, unlock. Okay, uh, we'll generally go down this way first, and that's because um, you're going to get heat shields, which is sort of important for coming back, well, I don't know. Uh, there, there have been some good survivals from orbit without heat shields recently, so I don't know how important that is, but radial mount parachutes are pretty handy. Uh, batteries are super handy, but probably the most important thing, solar panels, because eventually your electric charge will diminish on the longer missions, and this is also a probe core, which means that you won't have to launch with a Kerbal on board, so you can just launch a probe. Uh, it is pretty dangerous to risk our Kerbals on every single mission, and also they're pretty heavy. Uh, the, well, the Kerbals themselves don't have additional mass as long as they're in the pod. Outside the pod they have mass, by the way. Uh, but uh, the pods, the capsules are 0 0.77, 0 0.84 tons, right? And so you have to carry all that along in order to control your craft. Uh, this is only 0 0.1 tons, so you can make much smaller craft if you're using a probe core. So that's one reason we want to get to that. Not every mission requires a Kerbal, and you can get a lot of science just hopping around with a little probe. But there is an engine that you will want, and that is the Terrier, LV-909. Nothing about the DLC has changed the importance of the LV-909. It is still a super important engine to get to, and so solar panels and the LV-909 are our major things now that we've unlocked these basic two, of course. So, first things first, we have got a little bit of reputation now, and we have a lot more contracts. Um, all I really want to do is escape the atmosphere. They give you a lot of these tests, well, focused observational surveys, or like tests of particular parts. I generally hate those, um, but you know what, uh, this parachute test is probably possible. I mean, we're talking about somewhere between 2 kilometers and 5 kilometers and 130 meters per second and 230 meters per second. We're probably going to deploy the parachute. So, okay, I'll take that. We're not going to do orbit just yet. We'll hold off on that. And we could have tested the SRB at the... I uh, saw it rocket booster is what I call it. It says solid fuel booster here. I'm not going to call it SFB ever. I'm going to always call them SRBs. And uh, we could test that on site, but it's a waste of time. So let's just get on with it. Okay, so here is our capsule, the one that we are definitely using. And I had uh, gotten into the VAB and unlocked the decoupler already. Once we have a really big rocket underneath this, there's no way that this one parachute is going to be able to carry it all safely to a touchdown so we do need to get rid of the rest of the rocket before we set the capsule down Un unless you want to like per put girder segments all over the place like this and add uh, and add parachutes you could do that I mean of course uh, if you want to recover the entire rocket right away um, maybe that's a thing for you uh, you could conceivably and this is the only fuel tank we have uh, conceivably have a huge rocket like this and uh, again I'm going uh, now I'm going to talk about how to build a rocket and you know uh, uh, want to lay it on its side maybe uh, though you have to be careful about the center of mass here you can see the center of mass is tending to one side uh, you click this button to show the center of mass so we want to tuck those in Ah, how do I do that? Well, that's this tool here, move. That gives you this gizmo. 
and uh, you want to press 2 to enable that. Press 1 is normal placing, 2 is moving, 3 is rotating, so if I want to rotate like that, I could rotate it, and 4 is rerouting. Right now the root part of this is the Mark 1 command pod, but in some very specialized situations you might not want the command pod to be the root part, and we'll discuss those much later on. Right now that's quite sufficient. So uh, here we've got a parachute on here, and uh, it is not impossible. Actually, I, sh I tucked it in too well because now I can't quite reach the skirt segment. Another trick is go up here and descend down, and maybe no, it's not gonna let me pick. Oh, yeah, no, I've got place on. Hmm. Okay, can you? Uh, ah, ah, here we go. All right. Actually, you know what? I, I didn't have to do that. We've got that there. Um, we could like have an array of these. Place one. Alt, hold Alt to copy. So hold Alt to copy. And now we have copies. We've got parachutes all over the place. And we can, you know, potentially this whole thing could be brought down safely. But, but that's a lot of extra mass. Uh, each of the girder segments is one, uh, 0.125 tons. Each parachute is 0.1 tons, so that's 2.25 tons. Four of them all together, uh, that's 0.9 tons, which means that the parachute system we've got here, it weighs more than the capsule. So that's not great. Yeah, so for now, let's just decouple them off and not try and rescue them. Now, we've got this engine and also this SRB. This is a liquid fuel engine, which means that unlike the SRBs, you can throttle it, you can shut it down early, and also it's got better efficiency. Efficiency is this engine ISP number you might have been wondering about if you haven't seen it before. Uh, the efficiency of the SRBs top out at 165 in vacuum, and every engine is more efficient in vacuum than at sea level because at sea level the atmosphere is sort of pushing against the thrust. So if you can imagine the engine here, right at the engine edge, the nozzle exit here, uh, there is an atmosphere pushing against the thrust coming out, and so it is less efficient. In vacuum, there's nothing pushing against it, so the thrust can go out at its maximum efficiency. So yeah, that's what that is. And so the, uh, I don't think theoretically there's any engine that is more efficient at sea level than vacuum. That's I believe not possible, but you always have to be careful about saying it's not possible when it comes to sciency things, because somebody is always out there to prove you wrong. Anyway, um, obviously this engine has much more thrust than we need. It's got 16 tons of thrust at sea level, and you know, uh, right now this stack is uh, four four tons. So the downside to the liquid fuel engines is that they're heavy. And you can see this has the fuel inside, and basically a solid fuel booster is an overgrown firework. It's just the fuel plus the nozzle. The liquid fuel engines are a little bit more complicated and they're pretty heavy. So once we put this on, we see that uh, we're about 6 tons and it can carry 16 tons. The question is, um, do we want to make a rocket that looks like this? Now, well, or even, because we, we have more room in our, uh, okay, 12.6 tons. Well, that's still under 16 tons. Does this seem like a good idea to you? Well, probably not. Uh, there are a few reasons. Uh, first of all, it looks like, the, if you know anything about Kerbal Space Program, you know that these all have little joints between them. So there's a joint here, joint here, joint here, joint here, and each joint has its own ability to wiggle. And so side to side give. So there's a lot of side to side give in this particular stack. You can avoid that if you enabled advanced tweakables, there is a thing called auto strutting, but you don't get auto strutting immediately. Auto strutting uh, comes with the strut part in the tech tree, and we have not unlocked the strut part in the tech tree. So this thing is going to wiggle. Uh, that might not be so much of a problem, but it is worrisome. 
Another thing is, is it really efficient to have all the fuel in one stage? Well, there is a way of calculating that. The way of calculating that is a little bit complicated and has something to do with delta V. But I'll give you a rule of thumb to follow so that you can get an idea. The optimal amount of fuel in the stage is double the dry weight of the stage. Okay, so let's say we've got this thing. Well, the fuel mass of this stage is about six tons. Here, this tank here has 0.5 tons of fuel. So that's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So that's three tons of fuel right there. Okay, you can see 0 0.22, 0 0.27, add it up, that's 0.49. And I'm just rounding off to 0.5. I think in, uh, it's just uh, leaving off a digit and it's actually closer to 0.5. Uh, so we're talking about three tons of fuel and we've got six tons of mass. So right now the empty mass of this is going to be three tons. So this isn't optimal. Now we're at three, six, six tons of fuel and 3.23 tons empty mass and that's about double. So this will probably be the optim optimal configuration with this particular engine and then we should have something at the bottom and we would uh, have a different stage then. There are mathematical reasons why this is the optim optimal situation. For those who know about Delta V, let me quickly pause the video and calculate the delta V and come back to you with that. I obviously don't have Kerbal Engineer here, but I can tell you what it is and what it should be. What it should be, if it's optimal, is that number times 10. Uh, so, or 9.81 technically. It's supposed to be equal to the exhaust velocity of the engine. And so what we're looking for is for the velocity that this stage can impart should be equal to uh, the exhaust, the velocity of the exhaust, which in this case is roughly 10 times the ISP, and that so we're looking for 3,200. But let me come back to you with the actual calculation. Okay, so the actual calculation says that the delta V of this stage right now is 3,296 meters per second, and that's pretty darn close to that number times 10. So it's 3,296 and we wanted 3,200. I'm going by this ISP. If we go by this one, we would just get something closer to 2,500. So it's about 2,500 meters per second of ISP at sea level and 3,200 vacuum. And um, if you want to know the mass fraction right now, the mass fraction, which is the, fra uh, the ma I mean, I should say mass ratio, is the ratio of the fueled stage versus the unfueled stage is 2.85. The optimal is equal to the number E. So the number E is 2.71 and we're at 2.85. Okay, so that gives you an idea for an optimal staging. And again, you just want to make sure that the amount of fuel you have is double the dry weight and then you should be pretty good to go. That's roughly what you want. So here's the thing. Right, there's a cute little stage, and I'm saying that this is the best that this can be right now. Let's try and get up into the uh, out of the atmosphere and into space. We'll uh, we'll just alternate. Let's have Jeb go go for this one. Honestly, though, this is gonna be more than we need. But let let let's let's just go with it for now. Let's call this beta. Perhaps we should try. Oh, I should dump the mod propellant. We don't need that. Um, no, for this mission, we'll just go with it. We haven't picked up the orbital one yet anyway. Okay, here we go. So, to space. Which brings up another question. Where is space? Space in Kerbal Space Program by default is at 70 kilometers. In real life, phase sort of, space sort of fades in if you will, or the atmosphere fades out. And there's no real definite line, though. If you pass 100 kilometers, pretty much everybody agrees you're in space. Um, it's possible to set a lower limit 
uh, like, you know, even 50 kilometers, because you're really not able to breathe or survive at all at that altitude anyway. And, but there is a lot of atmospheric drag still at 50 kilometers, so people usually don't say that. By the way, I can control this rocket for two reasons. Not only do we have the reaction wheel up there, but you might have noticed that the nozzle was turning. And this particular rocket engine lets you control the rocket like that. Now, we don't want to get too high here. I said 70 kilometers, so we're, we're above 70 kilometers already. So we don't need to overshoot. And there's a good reason not to overshoot because, uh, yeah, it's nice to go up, but it's a little bit harsh to come down again. The higher you go up, the harder you come down. So we want to keep an eye on that and not overshoot. You can see I do have quite a bit of fuel left. So we, we are definitely not maxing out the capabilities of this particular rocket. But yeah, engine gimbling. I'll show you that in the VAB. If your engine can gimbal, it'll have this option, gimbal free, which means that you can decide whether to lock it or not, whether you want the engine to actually be turning. And also, if you think it's uh, turning too much, it's a little bit too twitchy, you can limit that. So yeah, uh, that is an important feature of some engines, not all engines, not all engines gimbal. So watch out for that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Then you can control your rocket with that instead of reaction wheels or anything. And that's really how most rockets control themselves is with engine gimbling in real life. They do not have reaction wheels <laughs> to control themselves. Okay, and they generally don't use fins. You notice I didn't put a fin on this one because I knew we had enough control just with the engine gimbling, even if I turned the reaction wheel here off. By the way, you can. Reaction wheels normal, SAS only, pilot only, normal. Well, 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 we can just turn it off like that. Okay. Well, anyway, we need to dump this part. We are in space. Let's have uh, Jeb do basic space science, which is crew report. Keep. I could have put more science on here, but I'm not rushing to science right now because I have a lot to talk about after all. In general, you might want to release the stages in such a way that they do not come back to hit you. I that didn't do that. Okay, so we're coming straight back down. It's got to be a little bit harsh on poor Jeb here, but he's used to it. So again, uh, 70 kilometers is the line for space. It's a hard line in Kerbal Space Program. And past 70 kilometers, you can do what might be referred to as regular time warp. And the time warp steps will be 1x, 5x, 10x, 50x, 100x, and so forth. Inside the atmosphere, you can't time warp like that. You can only do what's called physical time warp, which means that the game is calculating all the physics all the time. On regular time warp, it stops calculating some of the physics. So keep that in mind. Uh, and that's just so that I can time warp faster. But inside the atmosphere, it's always calculating the physics. And... Uh, 2x, 3x, 4x is the max you can go. So you can't time warp quite that quickly. But I'll just time warp a little bit so that we get to the point where we can deploy chutes and all. Atmospheric drag will slow you down. And again, I, I personally, uh, because they didn't always have the little red icon there, I wait until I'm at 270 meters per second and then, then I think it's pretty safe. We're going to splash down in the water, which is handy. We can do some science in the water too. Now, besides that, we might want to wait until we reach the parachute contract area, which is five kilometers. And also we need to be going slow enough. So 230. So we're low enough, but we're not slow enough. But I don't know. Can I wiggle to slow down maybe? And... Okay. Uh, I swear it cheated me. Come on! Ah, whatever. Okay, let's recover Jeb. Oh, I forgot to do the water signs, darn it. That's alright. Uh, that's mainly alright because I don't want to rush the whole science thing because in a way I want to get through some of this stuff on more basic science. 
if you happen to be ahead of me in science, it's fine. If I'm ahead of you in science, that makes things a little bit more difficult for you to follow along. So I, I don't want to be ahead of viewers in science at all. So uh, yeah, basically that's, that's probably a good thing. Oh, we've got some extra debris there. Let's cover that. All right, so I'll leave it there for now, and we'll try and handle getting to orbit in the next episode. But I think I've uh, handled the basics here, and we'll continue on from here. All right, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.